Did you go to the talk by the set guy the day ago? No, I didn't make it It's kind of interesting given the title of your talk because as he was describing this test framework they built for set like years and years ago, it seems bizarrely similar to Ansible. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like they built something that looks a lot like Ansible as an integration test framework. This is before Ansible even existed. Because <laughs> he's like, oh, yeah, we kind of describe the you know, all these hosts on the network, and we can have these YAML files which say, you know, run these jobs on these hosts. And I'm like, wow, what's this thing? Just keep reinventing the wheel. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to the final session at DevConf 2018. So we have with us Micah Abbott from the project Atomic at Red Hat, and he's going to be talking about misusing Ansible as an integration test framework. So welcome, Micah. Thank you. Uh, we made it, guys. Last day of DevComp, last talk. Thank you all for being here. I know everyone wants to get home, most likely, or go off to do other things. Um, so yeah, my name's Micah. I work at Red Hat. I'm a senior quality engineer. Uh, I've been working on uh, Red Hat Atomic Host and now Red Hat Core OS. Uh, and this is about how we were misusing Ansible to test Atomic Host. Uh, this is going to be more like a retrospective on how we, on what we were doing. Because um, as we're moving to uh, support Core OS, we're going to take, we're actually taking a different tack. Uh, and I'll get to that towards the end of the talk. Um, so I'm going to start with talking about how we we got to this point of using Ansible and then some of the problems we faced when we used this method and the solutions and sometimes just workarounds to the problems we, we encountered. So how did we get here? So back in December of 2014, I was hired as the first QE guy to work on Red Hat Atomic Host. Uh, we had like little to no test process, little to no automation at the time. So I got tasked with the normal activities of, you know, come up with a test plan, automation, and we were really starting to invest in uh, continuous integration and delivery. So I was also tasked with starting to help contribute in that uh, area as well. Uh, the goals we had for testing uh, Atomic Host after we got ourselves settled was testing the integration of many parts rather than the separate parts itself. Uh, Atomic Host is an OS. It's, you know, there's a bunch of different packages, a bunch of different components that go into it. We didn't want to be responsible for testing each individual piece. We wanted to leverage the testing that already happened, but we wanted to make sure when you put it all together, it worked correctly. Uh, we also wanted to make the automation easy to develop easy to use and easy to integrate with the continuous integration system that we were working with. And we also had to overcome the challenges of working with an immutable host like Atomic Host. For those of you who aren't familiar with, familiar with it, it's based off of OS tree and RPM OS tree developed by the one and only Colin Walters back there. Sorry, Colin. Um, but it, uh, it presents certain challenges that you wouldn't normally get when working with a traditional uh, Fedora or RHEL system. You most of the file system is, immut is immutable, so you can't write to the, the places you're normally accustomed to writing. There's no concept of YUM or DNF, so you can't install packages. Um, and we're also trying to learn the container best practices. How do we put uh, software and applications into a container and apply that to uh, uh, how we test it as well? So. Since we didn't really have anything specifically uh, geared towards testing uh, Atomic Host, uh, I started asking around to the people who did, who were working with it, and I found someone who had started working on this makeshift framework called UAT Framework. Uh, it was a combination of Python and Behave, and it utilized the Ansible API to talk to the host. Um, so Behave is a, a behavior-driven dri development uh, tool uh, built on top of Python. So we were kind of, I was kind of encouraged that maybe we could leverage that and get more test cases contributed from people outside of the QE organization. So we're, you know, the, the in Behave particular, you write a test case saying like, I want to upgrade the atomic host. And then it's up to the person implementing the test to go write the necessary code in the back end uh, to translate that. So we're, I was hopeful that we would just get a bunch of test cases in natural language and we would just be implementing it, but that didn't really pan out. Um, 
this whole framework had a lot of layers of abstraction, so we were really slowed down as we tried to pick apart the pieces in the model and figure out where it broke in the different pieces, in different stack and different use cases. Um, additionally, the Ansible API at this point, we're using a uh, Ansible 1.9 when we started. It was really simple, and uh, but also really, really, really simple in terms like of how to use it, but it was difficult in making it do the things you wanted to do, so it was a weird uh, juxtaposition. So we spent a lot of time underwinding errors, like I said, going going through the abstraction and figuring out where the, the, the problems existed. Um, the API was really poorly documented. It was basically, I was basically in the Python shell saying help on the different functions, trying to figure out what it did. And then when Ansible 2.0 came out, it was like a whole new API introduced a lot of breaking changes and all of a sudden we were left with a like decision point. Do we continue to try to push this framework forward or do we try to go in a different direction? And so we decided we should evaluate our options. Um, we needed something that was easier to develop and use. We realized that a lot of our tests were basically just running commands over SSH on the remote host. And we wanted to be able to run the tests across the different variants of Atomic Host. So we had a Fedora a version, well, multiple Fedora versions, the Red Hat version, and a CentOS version. So if we had a test that could run across all three platforms with little modification, that'd be awesome. Additionally, I'm kind of a, I was a, la I'm a lazy engineer and a terrible programmer, quite frankly, so I didn't want to invest the time to build up an entire new framework, uh, a test framework to, to achieve these goals. And since we were already using Ansible under the covers, I should just do this with an Ansible playbook, maybe. So we started doing that. Uh, we took the existing Sanity uh, test case that we had for uh, or I should say sanity set of tests uh, that we had for Atomic Host and we turned into a playbook around, as a proof of concept around February in uh, 2016. Being completely new to Ansible as a playbook, uh, using a playbook, we didn't have, I didn't have any roles. It was just including files full of tasks. Kind of looked like this. And this is actually a, a, the Git checkout from like the first commit I made to the repo. You know, there's, couple of Ansible file modules, a couple of shell callouts, and just a bunch of includes that are just relative to the, the test itself. Yeah. Uh, but we started to get some success, so I, I convinced the, the powers that be to host this, this set of tests called Atomic Host Tests, awesome name, right? Uh, under the Project Atomic uh, GitHub uh, organization on, Git, uh, on GitHub. Uh, we added Vagrant support to the, the framework so that you could do a Vagrant up, get an atomic host, and it would automatically run the playbook for you, this, this, this Sanity playbook or any other playbook. It didn't really take off in terms of people using it. Um, it was sort of like a nice, like, oh, look what we can do with Vagrant, but didn't really plan, pan out again. And then finally, I, you know, I've been doing a lot of this work by myself with some help from the development team and uh, uh, other people, but we finally got a second quality engineer to work on these tests with me, and that's, that's when we started to like really, uh, we were starting to get, get better at it. Like we were starting to learn more about Ansible, how to, the proper way to use it, start to incorporate roles, things like that. Um, we were testing across multiple versions of Atomic Host. We were hitting a lot of the goals, so we were feeling really good about it. But there was a lot of pain. So number one, Ansible is terrible at handling reboots. Uh, you know, Ansible is a descriptive language where you're basically telling, you're, you're describing the state of the system. So it's hard to describe a system as reboot. You know, it's either up or down. It's either doing some action. Reboot doesn't really fall into their, their model. Uh, the default output from Ansible playbooks is god awful. Uh, it's just JSON. Oh wait, where'd it go? I used to have, oh, it'll come back later, I'm sorry. I forgot the order of my slides. Awesome. But anyways, it's, like def it's just like JSON without any line breaks. It's really difficult to parse and debug and triage. So we were fighting with that when we got errors. When we, when we chose Ansible, I had the idea of like, well, if we fail as early as possible, 
it proves it, it, it will prevent us from shipping uh, an atomic host that has problems. Um, what? <laughs> well, the, the problem with that is, you you know, if you fail early in your test, you're missing a lot of coverage. Yes, exactly. So, um, the other problem we had with this is that once the playbook fails, Ansible basically terminates all your SSH connect connections, and it's hard to go back to the host and grab debug information, logs, or whatnot, you know, using just the, the normal Ansible model. Uh, and we had some difficulty selecting, like, which t tests from a playbook to run uh, originally, because I said we were s still kind of like Ansible novices, and we hadn't quite solved all the problems yet. But number one, like Ansible is not a programming language, so like we were completely misusing it as such. Like we were trying to do, you know, conditional operations and complex operations that would be pretty easy in any other language. But in Ansible, it's you're trying to do it with YAML and it's DSL, and just, that's when we kind of realized we made a huge mistake. But we were already too far into it, so we had to just keep pushing forward. <laughs> And uh, so we, we started to attack the problems that we had and try to figure out solutions to the different problems. Uh, we, a lot of the work, I mean, a lot of these solutions, I gotta say, came, didn't come from myself, it came from the other engineer in our team. He's not here today, but his name is Mike Nguyen, and he's, uh, he's been very helpful. And Jonathan as well over there, he helped us with this. Specifically, the, uh, improving the reboot, reboot handling. So one of the problems is, uh, just doing like a shutdown command or shutdown minus R command an Ansible, the SSH connection can get terminated before Ansible knows it, it's actually been successful at issuing the command. Um, so the, the, the common way to solve this now, and at the time when we, when we came up with this, it, Ansible didn't really have a good way of, of, of uh, telling its users how to handle uh, reboots. It wasn't until about Ansible 2.0 where they actually put out a, an article saying like, oh, this is how you do shut uh, reboots, guys. Like, that makes perfect sense, right? So it's an asynchronous action. You add a sleep before the shutdown in a shell command that's, you know, uh, logically combined, and that actually worked pretty well. I mean, we were actually able to reboot um, pretty consistently, but we still had other problems in that space. Um, if the reboot command doesn't succeed, the host hasn't gone down, so Ansible doesn't know it hasn't gone down. Um, and when it comes back and looking for the host again in a further task, it's just just assumes that it's rebooted. But if you're expecting something to have changed because of the reboot, your tests are going to fail. Um, so what we came up with was comparing the uh, the boot ID from the, the proc file system. Um, I'm not going to show you the code because it's just taking the boot ID before you reboot and then comparing it to the next one uh, when it comes back. So here's this is the slide I want. This is the, the part I wanted to show you. This default output from Ansible is awful. Um, so here I've run a command on the atomic host. Atomic host status. It's supposed to give you a nice, pretty output of when you run it by as a user. It gives you a nice, pretty output of the state of the system in terms of the the, the version you're running and the commit ID. But right now, like if you try to parse that, you'd be pulling hair, your hair out of your head because it's it's just it's a mess. Um, so Mike wrote a callback plug plugin to basically make it pretty. Uh, it looks a lot like this. Uh, it basically takes the, re the, the, the result object from, from Ansible, uh, breaks it into the different parts, like standard out, standard error, uh, the, the message, you get the return code and whatnot, and breaks and actually uses the line breaks that, are, uh, that come in through, through standard out. So the same command now looks like this in our logs. So when we have an error in the, the in the test, we can go into the logs and easily pick out. Uh, oh, the rec return code is not not zero, for example. So there's a failure there. I mean, not not in this example, but if it was a failure, uh, and we can look at the standard out, and we can even look look at the standard error if it, if it was a failure. So that that this this is like a huge one. Like it made our lives so much easier once we could actually look at output and and understand it. Um, so the problem of capturing information after the uh, from the host after a failure, Mike came up with this kind of 
hack way to uh, use a handler uh, to go onto the host and pull out the journal. It was like a, it's a role that ca that called a handler on failures, which then would go in and like set up some names and grab the journal. It, I mean, it. it you shouldn't have to do this much work with a test framework to be like, give me the logs from a failed system. But hey, we're we're bought into this, so we had to do it, and uh, this actually works. I mean, it's it's not pretty, but it works. Um, we were able to get logs and journals and whatnot. Uh, the failing fast problem. So how do we get the rest of the system that we missed or test the rest of the system that we missed? So we can't, Mike came up with this idea. I mean, Mike should really give him this talk. He's not here. He's on, he's in Hawaii. Uh, I know, tough life, right? <laughs> um, so he came up with this idea of a meta playbook. Uh, once we switched to using Ansible 2.2 or 2.4, I can't remember which, we were able to use block and rescue uh, more more frequently or, or better suited to our, our, our use case. Um, so if you can see this on, on the screen, we've got a block and rescue definition where it includes some tasks, sets a fact based on the results of the include task uh, um, call, and then at the very bottom, at the end of this, it rolls up all these all these facts into into one, and then prints out a nice log of like, oh, the, these parts of the test uh, have failed or passed. Um, but again, this, you shouldn't have to do this in a test framework. Like it should just it should happen more naturally, right? Um, so the problem of it being not a programming language, I mean, there's nothing you can really do to get around that necessarily. You can work around some of it by using like in, inline Python. Um, and I was told when I, I gave my slides to be reviewed by somebody that I should be prepared, prepared to defend this because I guess there are people who are uh, better at Ansible than I am who would just write a bunch of YAML to do this. but. For example, you can do these kind of hacks where you're doing you're using like splits on strings and capturing those. If only another variable is is set, other else you use another variable. I mean, not fun to read by any matter, matter of the, but you can. These are the kind of hacks and tricks you can do with Python in your Ansible playbooks if you care to do so. Uh, so selecting the subset of tests, that was a pretty easy one. We just started using tags. We just we tag everything into one like functional group. So like this is the upgrade set of tasks and this is the reboot set of tasks. And that made development a lot easier because then we could just say, oh, run these set of tests when they were when we we're trying to debug which one failed or whatnot. Um, but it still wasn't really like great because if you forgot to tag in a piece of the functionality, then you're wondering why it didn't work correctly. Um, so the, the way our repo is set up right now is that at the top level we have a roles directory, a callbacks, pl a callback plugins directory, and then a test directory. The test directory has all the playbooks which require the roles at the top level. So you could do like a relative, you know, call to the role, but we didn't want to like, it look, didn't look pretty to us, so we just symlinked everything. Um, Again, not the best solution, not the prettiest solution, but uh, it got us, got us, got around it, and uh, it's been working so far. I mean, sim links are sim links. So the conclusion here: um, it was a lot of pain, not just some pain, a lot of pain. But we, it worked for our use case, and our use case was pretty well defined. We had this immutable host. All the, and the other the other thing I'll mention here is all these tests were basically single host use uh, tests or single host test cases. So we were just running it one playbook against a single host and just testing functionality, and that's it. Like we didn't get into the larger, like running a Kubernetes cluster across you know six nodes type of thing. Um, we had a lot. It was easy, relatively easy to develop and maintain and execute these playbooks. Uh, it didn't re require any specialized software on the host, which was big for an immutable host. All we needed was SSH, which like every Linux system has, and Python, which most Linux systems have. Um, and we had a, it was easy for us to run these from a Jenkins job. 
Uh, yeah, it made us, yeah, and the other big game here was the ability to write the test once with a little bit of sugar to make it work across multiple variants, and then we end up with like this. This is our um, ad hoc dashboard basically on in the repo itself uh, on GitHub. So here we're testing 11 different variants of Atomic Host uh, that we, we run on our internal Jenkins. We then uh, publish our results to an S3 bucket so you can get the logs. You can still get the logs. You can't see the jobs themselves publicly, but you can see the results publicly, which was important to us for the, the community distributions like Fedora and, and uh, CentOS. And we got a nice badge generated from badges.io. So it kind of looks like we know what we're doing. Um, it's mostly green, so we must be doing something right. Um, yeah, and so this is like this is what our, our our bar for success. Like we we got we're testing eleven some odd uh, uh, variants plus the rel variants that are internal. Um, so we were doing pretty good. However, and this is where this is the swerve at the end of the the talk. Don't do this. Just don't use Ansible as a test framework. It's not suited for it. It's you saw all the problems we had, you saw the workarounds we had, use something else, like a bash script would probably be better at this point. Uh, you could use Ansible to like prototype some tests that fall into this model of, I need to run some commands on a host to make sure they ran correctly. That, that's a fine use case, I think, for Ansible, because it, it has the underlying, uh, the underlying tech to do that, or the underlying functionality to do that. Again, it's not a programming language. Like, like there's a, I think there's actually a pretty, there's a blog post out there that, that has this title of like Ansible is not a programming language and, and instructs you not to do exactly what I just did. <laughs> um, we had to use some hacks, workarounds, and general abuse of Ansible. If we were going to start over, we would do something. We would use something like PyTest or Avocado or OpenQA or you know whatever the. the, the Anything other than Ansible right now. <laughs> I mean, I'm sad to say. Uh, and like I said at the beginning, now that we're working on Red Hat Core OS, we got really lucky that the Core OS guys had a really slick test framework called Cola that's written in Golang. Um, it does things like provisioning in all the different clouds they support. It does things like capturing the logs and the errors automatically. Uh, you can write native Go functions and run them on the host. So it really exp expands like what you can do in terms of testing a, 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 an immutable host. Um, and I'm actually looking forward to uh, using that in the future as we test CoreOS to completion. That's it. Thanks for listening. Is there any questions? Yes, sir, Adam. Um, oh, wait. Okay. Microphone. Okay, microphone. Sorry. I need a um, so I'm just curious. Uh, this whole thing got written specifically for Fedora Atomic Host uh, called Two Week Atomic, and that has its own set of tests, which got in a thing called AutoCloud. And I didn't know until now that there was this whole other set of tests, which is also being run on Fedora Atomic Host, but it presumably isn't looping into the release process in any way. Just how did that happen, and are there plans to change it? Or communication? I mean. I don't have a good re good reason other than poor communication, and we, much like a lot of the open source community, just have a limited amount of time to get the things done you want to get done. Um, I remember having discussion with uh, Kushal, uh, Kushal Das, right? Yeah, I had a few discussions with him, and he, I think he actually got some of this working in AutoCloud, but we never got it like fully plumbed in and. Yeah. This stuff came first, to be clear. Like you, you were first, then two week atomic stuff came after. I just checked the timelines. Oh, okay. Like 2014 or something. You know? Well, that's when I got hired. We didn't start doing this until like 2016. Yeah, I mean, I think there was a little bit of overlap. Yeah. yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Go ahead, Mike. 
So in my workplace, we're using Ansible for patching uh, homogenous workstations and dozens of servers running very different applications. Yeah. And usually our patching you know, verification is, oh, make sure the service is running, make sure it's listening on a port. Mm -hmm. It seems like, especially even if even if we were patching them manually, it seems like this would be a good way to do those basic sysadmin verification. Yeah, I think that's a, a a valid use case for Ansible. You know, describing the state of the system, and Ansible does a very good job of like once you describe the state of the system and make sure it, it does everything it can to make sure it, it is that state. So if you're saying like apply this patch and make sure this service is started, it will make damn sure that as as best as it can that that service is started, and that's like your verification check. Um, Right, I bet like making sure it actually started successfully, though. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, you can, you can. I, I believe like the service module for Ansible has a like ways to configure it how to uh, trigger success. Like you can look for a particular port being open, like you you mentioned, or a particular string that's get out gets output in the logs or whatnot. Right. But don't quote me on that because I haven't actually used those. Right, like a simple example is the service is enabled, but oh, it doesn't start at boot. You have to manually start it five minutes later. That's the kind of thing we want to detect. But I feel like this would be a good way to solve it, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, like, Ansible's, uh, Ansible's has its use cases for sure. I mean, like I said, as a test framework, like we didn't, I mean, Jonathan and I had this discussion and we kind of came to the conclusion of we got the mileage we needed out of it, but it's time to go on to different things. Like, use Ansible for configuration management and, like, large-scale deployments, like that kind of thing. Don't use it to test software. Anything else? I, I'm sorry if I disappointed you by, say, by showing up and telling you that it doesn't work, that you're expecting to be, like, find this magical unicorn of, of software, but them's the brakes. Okay. Um, is there a plan to try and be more unified with testing using the COLA thing in the future? Because I mean, the auto cloud stuff is basically dead. No one's maintaining it. Is it um, so in Fedora side, the auto cloud stuff is kind of dead. It just sits there and runs, but no one's maintaining it. So is there anyone planning to sort of move forward with COLA or anything else and try and be more integrated and, and have all the things tested using the same thing? Yeah. I'll say yes. Um, there was somebody from Fedora QE. Remember his name, Jonathan or Colin? He was commenting on the Fedora tracker, like looking for collaboration in Fedora QA. Uh, Kate, Caleb or Caleb? Caleb. Not Caleb Lambert. Who? Oh, Cam yeah, Kate. Oh, oh, Camille. Right? Camille. Yes. So Camille's reached out to us. Um, he's. Yeah, and I, I was actually encouraged that he's getting involved as early as possible. We're not quite there yet to like, especially on the Fedora side, like Fedora Core OS is still like very much being defined. Right. So we're not quite there yet to be like, hey, here's our tests and here's what you, here, you we don't even have an image for them to test against, you know? So we gotta crawl before we can walk. Sure. But yeah, we, we to the, the, the short answer is yes, okay. we, we're having those conversations. Yeah, I know people have been told to sort of try and get it created. I just wanted to make sure it was all getting hooked up together in this well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's it. Have a good DEF CONF, everybody. Or Thank you very much, Michael. Thank so you. that was a final talk for the DEF CONF. And right now, at 3 p.m., we have... We are distributing a lot of fantastic prizes for a trivia game in the closing ceremony, which starts at 3 p.m. in the keynote room that's the Metcalf Large. So see you guys there. Work on what answer will get to the service you want to make sure it starts automatically. I'm not sure I totally do. I guess you have to see what the environment is. I don't know. 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 I don't
Inferno and you cast it, but you have to cast a system to say, you know, boots, you serve it as an evil, it doesn't get started successfully. You don't want to run an answer that's going to start the service after reboot. You want to verify that it only gets started to reboot. But if, you know, your virtualization cluster has to be the VM, you want to start automatically after reboot. Okay. 